There's the cross. Oh, wow. Jackson Yule. Morris looking to make it 2 nothing, And he did. I'm going to get his happy with my performances. And it's pushed to one side by Dane St. Clair. When we've got everybody fit and healthy, this, this team can compete with anybody. Coswell makes it 2 1 for TFC. It's the MLS Weekend Preview presented by AT&T 5G. Susanna Collins and Kaylin Carr here to get you all fired up for this weekend's action, aren't we, Kaylin? That's right, Suze. We're kicking things off with Orlando City versus uh, the Red Bulls. Uh, Pareja getting a lot of buzz this week for Coach of the Year. And the Red Bulls coming off two four-goal uh, wins here, getting what I call the new manager bounce. Hmm. Uh, Jurgen Dom casually posing with uh, a Lambo, but um, the real problem MLS players is have both Lambos? of these teams are struggling. I know, right? Right? What is yeah, going on? That's that's a trip. Uh, Montreal, Chicago, Henri spent the past week back in Canada without training. The Impact have lost four straight. On the other side, Baric has scored in four straight games, one shy of a club record. And Calvo All just right, got we... a new deal. Fantastic. We've got... Uh... New England taking on Nashville. Yonder Cadiz is in Music City. Um, he won't be helping them this weekend, and they need goals. Caitlin, Nashville's only scored two goals in seven away matches. Yeah, this is this is the one I have my eye on for the weekend, though. I think the highlight of uh, two of the better teams in the Eastern Conference. We saw what TFC did last week against Columbus, but this time having to do it against uh, the Union, who are on a roll. Houston taking on Sporting KC, the fourth meeting of this season for these two teams, and Houston has won two of the first three. My guy Johnny Russell, though, he has scored each of SKC's last four goals, Kalen. Have you seen this highlight, Susanna? Um, I have. Have you heard about times. it? <laughs> <laughs> Iguain getting another chance for redemption, this time going against New York City FC. Uh, but all the talk will again be on Iguain. All right, we've got Minnesota taking on Cincinnati. Jurgen Lacadia has not scored a goal since his MLS debut back in March. Since he only two goals since MLS's back tournament ended. Minnesota also struggling too. Yeah, Columbus though, uh, looking to get back on track. Columbus gave up three goals for the first time since last May. Um, Lucas Elarion also has a team high or league wide uh, three goals from outside the box. Not bad. Seattle taking on Vancouver. Uh, Caitlin, did you know that Seattle is the new 538 favorite to win MLS Cup? And are you surprised? No. <laughs> uh, I am surprised. <laughs> and uh, also here um, we have Chicharito. Can he get back on track? Which Earthquakes team will show up? Cali Classico, always a wild one. Always wild. And we wrap things up for the weekend with RSL taking on LAFC. The only match on Sunday. RSL beat LAFC 3-0 three weeks ago, um, including that goal from Justin Miram. Um, that's always fun when those two teams play. All right, here's a look at the Western Conference standings. Um, we've got Seattle sitting pretty right up there on top at 24 points. But worth noting, guys, Portland-Colorado match has been postponed. Um, Colorado will now have two games to make up this season. This is due to some positive COVID cases in the Colorado camp. So stay healthy, y'all. Yeah, definitely. And we'll flip it over to the Eastern Conference. Uh, Atlanta, Inter, Miami, D.C. all below the line. But I'm going to focus on the positive. Orlando, uh, fourth in the table right now. And there's a little bit of separation and gap between that top four. And as you look at Orlando, uh, if they get a win against New York Red Bulls and maybe get a draw from that Philly-Toronto game, they might be able to leapfrog or at least get up uh, near the top um, or, or inching closer. So Orlando, they, they've been the surprise so far, uh, building off their wonderful uh, play at MLS's back, but then continuing it uh, uh, on into uh, the regular season. Mm -hmm. As we say in the call-up, here for it. Kaylin Carr, welcome on in to the MLS Weekend Preview presented by AT&T 5G. Susanna Collins alongside uh, my good friend Kaylin Carr. Kaylin, last week um, I really, really waxed poetic about Columbus and how they were the most complete team, the best team in MLS right now. And then TFC came along and made a huge statement, a 3-1 win over Columbus. So um, up next, though, for Toronto. The Philadelphia Union. Now, we've talked about Columbus. We've talked about Toronto. we talked about Philadelphia. These are three very, very strong teams in the East. If we are using Toronto as sort of uh, the measuring stick, if you will, is this 
a must win game for Philly to sort of prove that they are a legit contender, that they are worthy to be in that conversation of being the best in the East? Come on, Susanna. What are you saying with this question? I mean, is it a must win? This Philly team has been consistent throughout, um, already clearly in that conversation as a contender um, throughout the season. I mean, uh, I I think they've been, look, the the schedule has been good for them in some ways. They haven't had to play against a Toronto yet. I think this will be the first time they're going to match up against them. Uh, But they've been beating the teams that they're supposed to. And I think when you look at this Philly team, they're always going to have the veteran presence. They've had the emergence of young players. Fontana has been a really nice uh, spark for them. And then also, even just the leadership qualities that you always get from Bedoya. But I I think Brendan Aronson and Mark McKenzie have have become leaders of this team. Not just young players that have talent, but have taken on uh, pivotal roles in this uh, this club. And then, yeah, it's it's nice to see this development. So I, I think, look, Columbus found out in the second half uh, against TFC, what a TFC, a motivated TFC team can look like and how mm-hmm. difficult that is. Got a little bit of a, a come back down to earth moment there. So I do think that Philly will look at this as a, as a chance to measure themselves. But when I look at the scope of the biggest matches that they've played maybe over the last couple of years, I remember Atlanta coming to uh, Chester and then winning that game last year or even that crazy one in the playoffs against the Red Bulls. They've had moments that have been big that they've sort of passed that test to me to be in that upper echelon in the Eastern Conference. But again, anytime you play against Seattle in the West or Toronto in the East, it is a chance to measure yourself up against uh, some of the best in the, in, the, in the league. Why haven't we talked more about the Philadelphia Union and the way that we have talked about the Columbus crew and Toronto? Um, and just because they have had a very, very good season. They are, um, you know, a, a pretty complete team and so why aren't we having the same conversations around them i have i have been since you've been there with me before mls is back tournament i picked them as my favorite to win it all no but i I actually do think that they have been getting the respect that they deserve i I mean this isn't a team that has won an mls cup or won a a trophy yet and and they've had they've gotten close and had some chances with the open cup but I, i do think maybe getting to that next hurdle of getting to an MLS Cup or, or winning mm-hmm. one would, would change the way the conversation is around this team. But um, I, I do think they're getting the respect they, that they deserve in the conversation. Jim Curtin is going to be up there. We talked about Pereja, but I think Curtin could be up there for a Coach of the sure. Year candidate. And then a lot of talk around the young players on this team and their emergence throughout. So uh, they're an exciting team to watch, have depth, experience, and, uh, and some youth. So um, Philly's been one of my favorite teams. When I, when I look at the weekend preview and I look at the slate of games, Philly's almost always a, a, a game that I'm excited to tune into. Success in the playoffs, though, I think is uh, oh, big, yeah! big mix. Mason expressed a, a desire that, you know, if he could go somewhere and hopefully be their number one striker, he would like to take the opportunity. And Troy finishes beautifully. And judging by the assurance with which she took yep. it, there could be plenty more. When, you, when you're young, you're frustrated. This is now Mason Toy. He scores! He's got that twinkle in his eye again, the boy. First goal of the regular season for Mason Toy. And just look how much it means. Well, some moving and shaking going on in MLS. Minnesota sending Mason Toy to the Montreal Impact in exchange for $600,000 in GAM and a second-round pick in the 2021 MLS Super Draft. Now, Mason Toy, uh, he's a young, promising forward. We have seen flashes of brilliance from this 21-year-old. But in Minnesota, it, it just never came together consistently for him, Kalen. And now we're seeing him move to Montreal, uh, he will be under the tutelage of Thierry Henry. Kaylin, is this the type of change of scenery that a player like Mason Toy needs in his development? Absolutely. I, I think he was almost left with no choice but to go in, mm-hmm. and, and it sounded like he went in and expressed his desire to uh, get a move, and, and I think that's a, that's a mature move for a young player to do. Not an easy thing to do, especially when you're so focused on trying to break through, but at times you got to just kind of read the, the room and see what's happened, and He's had flashes, you're right, and they've been some pretty spectacular ones. I think most notably the one against LAFC, but even in other matches, I mean, just the way that he's able to show some composure, the quality, and he's got all the uh, uh, sort of smarts to be able to find the right movement um, 
very fluid player, but it just hasn't really been consistent. And he's had some chances that he hasn't really taken um, when Adrian Heath has given him some, some minutes from the start. They haven't always turned into goals, which as a young player, that's what he needed. And Adrian Heath has also done a good job with young strikers in the past. If you look at Dom Dwyer, you look at Kyle Lahren. So that should be said. But when you look at the profile of striker that Adrian Heath continues to bring in, it's been much bigger number nines that are more traditional mm -hmm. back to goal, hold the ball up get in the box, and find goals. And that is not Mason's game. Mason's game is much more drifting off the back shoulder, finding runs in behind, slashing, uh, looking for space away from the two center backs. And that, at times, uh, is, a, is a different thing than maybe what Adrian Heath wanted. But guess who did that pretty darn well? Maybe the best who? ever to do that, play that style. Who, who could Mr. it be? Mr. Thierry Henry. And mm -hmm. when you look at the way he's been playing with Kyoto as the number nine Clearly not a traditional back-to-goal number nine and a bit yeah. has allowed a lot more freedom. So I think this is really a, a dream move in a way for Mason Toy, who, who has said he's uh, admired Thierry Henry as a, as a favorite player. So to be able to work under him, uh, and they came out and gave a, a good little uh, transfer fee um, to be able to get him uh, much bigger than somewhere else in the league. So for a, a striker that's searching for confidence, to have someone mm -hmm. of that sort of pedigree come and get you, I think is also going to... Um, help him transition and make him feel good about this move. Yeah, very excited to see what Thierry Henry will be able to do with a talent like Mason Toy because we have seen that he is capable. Um, talking a little bit more about Minnesota, they've been busy the last couple of weeks. Uh, they acquire Kai Kamara, uh, which speaks to exactly what you were saying about the type of strikers that Adrian Heath is bringing into this Loons team. I mean, he's 36 years old. Then we've got 21-year-old Mason Toy that they ship to, to Montreal with Looking at these moves, is Minnesota in the mindset right now of we need to win and we need to win now? I hope so. I think that's yeah. – if I'm a Minnesota fan, I, I, I understand there's going to be some disappointment about losing um, Toy, but I think Kai Kamara takes them up a notch, and I think he gives them a real possibility of, of getting to an MLS Cup and winning it. Mm -hmm. And – Personally, I'm excited for Kai because I was. it was great to see him. He's scoring goals everywhere he's been, but it felt like he was just going to kind of run up that history book uh, as far as you know all-time goals, but maybe not get wins or get close to a, t a title again, which he hasn't had in his career. He got to the final with Columbus Crew. So uh, I think his experience when things are going well for Kai, I mean, there's almost nobody better to have around. It's such a unique skill set in MLS. And one that I think has a little bit of both. He, he can get in, move in behind and find runs like that, but he's also uh, can play a little bit more back to goal and help facilitate. So um, with you look at the moves with Reynoso and, and in general, Minnesota right in the middle of the table right now. But if you want to knock off Seattle or LAFC, or if you want to go further on Portland on some of these tougher teams, sporting, uh, I think that making some of these moves to get some experience and a proven goal scorer, and one of the best to ever do it in MLS, is a, is a really smart move and a really smart move right now. Barlow settled off the chest. Tom Barlow with the finish, and we are tied! Hesho Akadeli sneaking behind a Beesler. Akadeli scores! Daniel Royer turns, bases, goal, shoots, he scores! Daniel Royer from distance! Now it's Bueller again. Lofts it in. Nani on the header, and he beats Shuttleworth. It's two for Orlando. Time now for AT&T 5G call to the field. And for that, we are so happy to bring in uh, our Fox Sports lead match analyst and our very, very dear friend, Stu Holden. What's going on, Stu? Your, your non-frosted tip friend, Stu Holden. Now, I know I got to throw it back. Kalen keeps asking me, but, you know, I just got to keep it. I'm a dad these days, Kalen. Oh. Come on. Oh, you're a cool dad, man. Don't do that. <laughs> I've seen, I, I, I follow you. I know what's yeah. going on. In the realm of dads, you are definitely up there on the cool factors too. I promise. I, I appreciate that, guys. Thanks for buttering me up at the start here before you start hammering me now. 100%. Well, we're so happy to have you. You are going to be on the call this weekend for Orlando taking on the Red Bulls, uh, that game at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on Fox. 
Let's talk about Orlando because they have been they've been kind of the the Cinderella story of MLS this season. Did so well in the MLS's back tournament and then have carried on that success into the regular season, unbeaten in their last 8 games, currently sitting in 4th place in the East on 26 points. Stu, what do you make of this? Is this a fluke or or Orlando City the real deer here? What's going on? Well, as if we needed any more proof uh, that Oscar Pereja is actually a good coach. Who would have known all those years in Dallas? And, you know, if you think back to that time, I think many people knew what he was doing with limited resources and bringing younger players through and making an FC Dallas team really exciting. A team that was continually at the top of the Western Conference. He goes off to Cholos down in Tijuana, Mexico. And then guess what? He comes back and he makes Orlando good. Something that nobody thought could happen. A team that has never qualified for the playoffs. A team that is perennially under underachieved. And then straight out the gates to get this team from a pretender to become a contender is really just a, a huge, a huge sign of respect and and really what Oscar Pereja is capable of as a coach. And this this team is for real, guys. I mean, we saw them in the bubble. There were moments where we're thinking, oh my goodness, is Orlando a good team? They've continued that. They've gotten stronger. They have really good players. They have a goal scorer uh, in Daryl DK that can score goals. Chris Mueller's playing well, Nani, et cetera. This is a really good team that that I think makes some serious noise in the playoffs. Yeah, I agree. And and I think in the conversations around coach of the year, he's got to be one of the first names that um, jump off the list. But in a lot of ways, yes, the story has been that he has been overlooked or he maybe hasn't been um, talked about as much as one of the top coaches in MLS. Do you think he is in that category? And if not, what does he need to do maybe this year um, to have more people talking about him and, and his performance? You know, K- Kalen, I think he is in that category already. And, and to my understanding, he was actually one of the final few candidates for the U.S. men's national team job and was ultimately beaten out by Greg Berhalter. I know that Oscar Pereja was interviewed. So he's clearly seen internally in the coaching realms and in and, and U.S. soccer realms as a really good coach and a coach that has massive uh, not just potential, but is actually a good coach right now. So, you know, I, I think his real strength is uh, conveying an identity, building a culture in such a short time. It, it's been fascinating talking to the players from Orlando City uh, about, you know, last year the buzzword was culture. This year you actually see it. The proof is in the pudding. Players fighting for each other. Uh, you'll watch a lot of their sequences in transition and actually – there's unselfishness. They're, they're making that extra pass as opposed to guys trying to finish and get the glory. That to me is a real sign of a group that's coming together and believes. Now I did catch some flack from Orlando city fans the other day, because I said, wait till crunch time, wait till the playoffs. That's when I think we're really going to find out if this team has the mentality, if they can win the tight games, the one zero games, the two zero games. And then actually if they have stars and players that can st- in the biggest moments and put this team over the line because it's all fire and well to qualify for the playoffs the first time. They'll absolutely do that this season, but how far can they actually go? I think it would be a massive letdown if it was just the playoffs and then bust in the first game. All right, Stu, let's flip it uh, to the other side of this matchup and talk about the, the New York Red Bulls because it's been an entirely different story for them this season. Uh, They're struggling. They said goodbye to Chris Armis. Uh, Reportedly, they are targeting Barnsley manager Gerard Strubert. Now, is this, is this, um, is it as simple as a coaching change that can fix what ails the Red Bulls? What, what is it that will help them get back on the right track here? I think it's beyond just the the coach at this point. Look at what Chris Armas did with almost zero investment in that squad. And the New York Red Bulls for a number of years now have made some really poor signing. Guys that they've brought in haven't quite panned out. I remember one Josh Sims that they brought over from England really just haven't gone out and spent any type of money. There's been a real transition from the Red Bulls organization from the Thierry Henry's and the Tim Cahill's and the Bradley Wright Phillips, Sasha Clestens, that era to now this we're going to develop our own talent. We're going to have this identity that, you know, we build this farm system. Guys know what it means to be a Red Bulls player, this high press. But people have figured that out pretty quickly. And this is a team that went scoreless in their last four games before they had the two four goal outbursts where you're starting to see signs. I don't believe this is a long term thing. I think this is just a short term. You've got a new coach, an interim head coach. You're getting a little bit a burst of goals. I don't see a squad and a team in the Red Bulls right now that has any chance of making any type of noise in that Eastern Conference. 
Stu, when you look um, ahead and one of the biggest topics right now in, uh, in American soccer has been the emergence of some young stars um, and this sort of golden generation or emerging golden generation for the U.S. men's national team, or at least we hope so. Um, and also the uh, advancement of a lot of young players in Major League Soccer and interest in some of them like Brennan Aronson or Mark McKenzie and others. Um, when you look at this year specifically, it's been a strange one. And with the absence of fans, do you think in some ways that maybe that's provided a little bit of a, of a different platform for these players to really integrate into big clubs around the world or even uh, throughout um, the teams that they're already on um, to, to find some confidence and then help with that transition to um, becoming stars themselves? Yeah, it's a fascinating conversation, I find, because you talk about this really unique period in just soccer, uh, global soccer, American soccer, where you have this combination of no fans, uh, five substitutions being implemented by FIFA, uh, li thin, limited roster space, a lot of games jammed into a tight period, and really you found coaches that really have no choice but to play some of these young players because guys are logging heavy minutes. Uh, you're picking up injuries along the way. You can only call up a certain amount of guys on your, on your roster. And I, I think Kalen, when we look back at this time, you're going to see players that have emerged during this period. Look at DC United playing a lot of young players right now. The Philadelphia union uh, is, is another one. LAFC debuted their first ever homegrown Academy player. Uh, the Seattle Sounders are playing young players. Just look across the board. I think we're going to look back in three or four years and say, look at the platform that these guys were given. They were given an opportunity in a relatively low pressure environment where you step onto the field uh, there's no fans around the early season games maybe don't quite mean as much because guess what? 10 teams from the East make the, the, the playoffs this year and coaches are using these players and giving them chances. And, and I really think it's a unique period that we'll look back on. And I think we'll have four or five players that have come from this that we can look and point back at that. They got their debut. They got their confidence. They got their footing, but more importantly, they earned their coaches trust to then be used in Trying to get around him, sends it in front. That's trouble. That's Sam Vines getting his first goal at the top. Fontana will give it a strike. Anthony Fontana has the go ahead goal. As far as Busio has a chance again to go near post, and he's found the back of the net. Gianluca Busio has got his first goal of the year. Play your kids, as they say, and MLS is loaded. With young talent and the annual 22 under 22 presented by Body Armor List is due out later this month. So with that in mind, Kaylin, we're going to get ahead of this trend and you are going to give us your top five 22 under 22 players. Take it away, my friend. All right. Thank you, Susan. Well, I, 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 first of all, I agree with Stuart. I like that his point of this is a unique year for young players to get opportunities mm -hmm. um, around the world. We've seen the emergence of young American stars abroad as well as here in the U.S. And I think when I looked at creating this list, there were a lot of good names. And it's hard to do. But I remember when we started this, uh, when I was at MLS like four years ago, it was a 24 under 24. Now yeah. it's a 22 under 22. I think pretty soon it'll probably be a 20 under 20 um, oh, and man. be mostly teenagers. And, and I think I only have one player on my top five who is above the age of 20 right now. So it just goes to show how much younger uh, players are getting and the opportunities that they're getting at a young age, which has been fantastic. But I'm going to start my list off. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, let's go for it. All right, number five, I'm going with Christian Caceres Jr. And I actually considered putting him higher. That's how much I think of him. It hasn't been the best year uh, for Red Bull New York, but uh, this, this young player has been really strong. And when you're playing for the Venezuelan national team, um, that says something to me. And there's not many players, when you look at the available list, that are getting international minutes um, and playing well. And I, I just think the thing that stands out to me about his game is his maturity. His poise, he, he has, uh, you know, all of the qualities where he can kind of go box to box. He's got the bite. He can chip in with some goals here and there. Um, the Red Bulls signed him to a contract this year, but I think that was really more with the idea that within a year or so, I, I think a team from Europe will come with seven figures um, coming after him. Uh, number four, I go with Brian Rodriguez. Uh, I, I talked about the importance of um, or, or the recognition of players that are playing internationally. Well, this guy doesn't just play internationally. He plays internationally for Uruguay. And... 
it hasn't been up to the expectations for himself, his club, or I think um, from the media this year of what we expected to see um, from Rodriguez. That said, two goals, six assists. So if you're going to look at a down year or a player that hasn't scored as many as he knows he can, uh, that's a pretty good uh, uh, stat line for somebody that has not lived up to expectations and has almost been disappointing. But that just shows you how high the ceiling is for Brian Rodriguez. Uh, Number three is a player kind of on the opposite side that has lived up to expectations and then some. Mark McKenzie, the uh, U.S. uh, international as well. And uh, look, I I think he's taken a big step forward this year as far as we we know some of the qualities. He always seems to find the right place at the right time. Um, He has the ability to kind of sniff out the right chances in the box to to stop things. But this is really the difference here. The, The ability to play balls forward, facilitate the offense, the pass before the pass, the right foot, the left foot. Uh, he has been really strong for them, as well as some leadership qualities. I think he's taken a big step forward as, as a player that I think has taken ownership of this Philly back line as far as uh, them, them being tough to beat in the back. Uh, number two is Cole Bassett, and I think this might be one that people might be a little bit surprised to see him rated so high. Uh, I think number two for me um, just shows how high I think his ceiling can be amongst this group right here. And and there's a lot of reasons why players are maybe not spoken about as much. I think some of it comes from maybe the Rapids not having as much success as we would have hoped them to have this year um, or or playing in a market that that doesn't maybe get as many national TV games. But Cole Bassett has a range of qualities that I find really interesting. Um, He's lanky. He can kind of turn and and move. He's good. Late arriving runs in the box. He's he's good in the air. He scored some goals off, off set pieces as well and some important ones. And then number one for me is Brennan Aronson. Uh, I think the most interesting young player in Major League Soccer um, has showed a range of his qualities. He's excellent in tight spaces, just has a feel for the game that, that you really can't teach, um, but has really changed his development in ways where he's able to find that killer pass or, or finish himself. He's got four goals, three assists this year. We talked to him over the offseason. He said he wanted to really get on the end of things. And boy, has he done it in a big way for this team. When you talk about the young players or player kids, uh, I, I feel like you've almost seen him learn and grow on the fly through his minutes um, and is why a, a team like Red Bull Salzburg uh, is reportedly coming in for him. So it, it, the top three on my list, all American players. Um, and, and I think that's new for Major League Soccer. Um, you generally mm-hmm. see Diego Rossi or some big name stars that maybe aren't right there um, right now in MLS. But uh, it's been amazing to see some of these young American players getting an opportunity and, and really running with it. So that's my list. Love it. Great stuff. I'm Kaylin excited Carr. to get dragged on social media for it. They're going to put I know, I know. Just all, the, all those emojis. Uh, um, yeah, it's the icing tough, on the cake. It. Just a, a reminder the full 22 under 22 presented by Body Armor comes out later this month. So, uh, yeah, keep an eye out for that. And of course, Major League Soccer, the BPC, and the MLSPA have launched MLS Unites to vote a league wide nonpartisan initiative to help players, staff, and fans. Register to vote. Check out MLSsoccer.com slash vote to learn more about how the league is looking to educate our community on the voting process, drive voter registration, and more. There's a shot. Go, San Jose. Chase Salinas off the bench. 1-1. One, one. Espinosa. There's the cross. Oh, wow. Go. LAFC is a tough team. This is a good fight for our guys. Happy to get a win. Let's keep this rolling. Another edition of the Cali Classico on tap this weekend. San Jose hosting the LA Galaxy. And after a couple, let's face it, brutal losses for them that saw them allow 11 goals while only scoring one, uh, they defied the, the odds last week with that 2-1 win over LAFC. And now for the Galaxy winless in their last four matches with only one goal during that stretch. So, Kaylin, I have a question for you. This is sort of like an either yeah. or. What is, what's more likely in this matchup? San Jose giving up two goals or less or Chicharito scoring for the Galaxy? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> well, it, for San Jose, it is either or. They either give up less than two goals or it's like five, six, seven goals. Uh, so. Yeah. That's going to be a tough one. I mean, these, these teams met earlier, um, well, I guess now last month in September, and played to a, a nil-nil draw. So that would sort of tend to lean towards less goals happening. And mm-hmm. Chicharito, 
really, it hasn't been either or, it's just been kind of empty. And it, he hasn't even really been getting opportunities or getting shots on goal. So mm-hmm. that is uh, concerning for them. And, and the Galaxy are, are either or too, where they've had uh, some amazing runs, where they've gone six games unbeaten and then now winless in their last four with only one goal scored. So uh, Cali Classico already is one that you don't know what to expect because it's always madness. Yeah. But I'm going to go with, I think it's more likely that San Jose keeps it under, two goals or under than Chicharito okay. scores because I've seen San Jose do that as, as of late. And frankly, I haven't seen any goals from Chicharito. I think Chicharito is going to score. I think he's he's feeling it. I think he says he's not. He's ignoring the uh, the press and all the the negativity. But I think this guy is motivated. He also was snubbed by the Mexican national team, and so uh, there's a little extra fire in his belly. Just saying, Chicharito all scores. Right, all right, all right. I like it. <laughs> all right, guys. Time now for. MLS Predict 6 presented by BetMGM, a weekly free-to-play game from Major League Soccer. Correctly predict the final outcomes of the six featured MLS matches along with secondary predictions such as which player or team will score first or how many total goals will be scored. And you could win 50000 bucks. Head on over to MLSPredict6.com. Play for free. Kalen. Ooh, kiss of death picks last week. They just continue for you. You were 0 for 2. Because National and Houston happened? drew, and then you you picked Jeremy Abobasi to score first in that Portland Vancouver game, and Abobasi yeah. didn't even start. Me, on the other hand, one for one, <laughs> one for one. Orlando really? and o- things or- are going Orlando good for you. Orlando and Dallas drew. Yeah, Orlando and, o- and Dallas drew, which was you know kind of a bummer. But I said that there were going to be four total goals between um, Seattle and the Galaxy, and that was a three-one game. And I actually remember saying that I thought that Seattle would have more of those goals and um yeah i was i was pretty much right on the money there so wow Did, make uh, of that what has, you will ha- has the direct deposit hit yet have you have you gotten the cash influx are you taking me out no sadly i on? am not eligible for that 50 grand okay. but um you know it's just yeah. it's just pride and bragging rights at this point so yeah I'll call well, it a win. That's what I'm here for is to uh, all right is to uh, embarrass myself and, and uh, do the impossible, which is to get these picks right. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Love it. But okay, I tell so you what, that pick? changes today, Susanna. That changes today. And yeah, I looked at the whole list and I was like, okay, yeah, Seattle's going up to Vancouver. That looks like the obvious one, but we've seen that on SAT questions where you make that pick and then they trick you. So I'm going with something a little bit more difficult: Toronto versus Philly, and I'm going Philadelphia. Yeah, I know. Toronto looked amazing last week uh, in that second half victory over Columbus Crew, who up to that point had been the best team in Major League Soccer for me. But I think it's been a difficult week for Toronto. They went back to Toronto. They haven't been able to train. Now they uh, have to go to, uh, I believe, Connecticut for this match, where Philly just keeps the ball rolling. Not the obvious pick, but I need some help right now. So I got to go <laughs> add the degree of difficulty, and I'm going with Philadelphia. I respect it. I respect it. All right. Uh, My pick. I am picking NYCFC over Miami. NYC coming off a 4-0 win over Cincinnati in a game where they looked really, really good. One of their more complete games of the season. They ripped Cincinnati apart. Um, which, you know, it's Cincinnati, but still uh, great game plan. Miami coming off a 3-0 loss to Philadelphia. Iguain. Got his feelings hurt in that one. Missed that PK. I don't know. I just, I got a hunch about NYCFC in this one. So that is my pick. I like it. I like it. All right. So we're going to secondary picks, right? Secondary picks. degree of difficulty. And look, I know I said I wasn't going to pick Seattle, Vancouver, but uh, I need a little bit of help here. (laughs) So I'm going for uh, Seattle to score against Vancouver in the, uh, what's the second range? I believe 10 to 19, I think is the minute. Yes, yeah. wow. 10 to 19. Thank you. Confirmation there. Uh, I, Vancouver has given up goals early in games. I believe uh, five goals maybe in their last two games. Or I don't know. They're, they're, they're giving up a lot of early goals. Seattle's coming out flying, and I think uh, they can hold off for 10 minutes, but then I'm hoping someone scores. And also, Susanna, I just can't pick players to score opening goals because – they don't always start. So I know somebody. I don't know who's going to sc- score it for Seattle. Made that mistake last week. Rui Diaz, Rui Diaz. But Rui I, I'm, Rui I'm Rui going, uh, uh, yeah, 10 to 19. What's All your right. secondary pick? All right. see, we'll see if you can redeem yourself. So my secondary pick, I'm looking at that Dallas-Columbus matchup. And I think the halftime score of this game is going to be 1-0. And I will say in favor of Columbus-Dallas scoreless in their last two games. And they're coming up against the Columbus defense that, okay, yes, they allowed three goals against Toronto. But... 
all in all, they have been super solid all season. So uh, yeah, one nil at halftime. Give it to Columbus. Feel good about that one. All right, let's take a look at the weekend schedule. And uh, yeah, on uh, Saturday, we've got that Orlando matchup against the New York Red Bulls on Big Fox. That game at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you don't want to miss that one. And Sunday, I just want to point this out, everyone. It's Kalen Carr's birthday on Sunday, in addition oh, wow. to uh, is it? some. Yes. Yes, it is. Old man Carr. Wow. Should we do so a, on... a, Zoom, a Zoom party? <laughs> Uh, Perhaps. Let's keep it light. Let's Perhaps. keep it light. I'm going to be celebrating <laughs> Saturday night with the Cali Classico. Um, you know, you always got to tune in for the madness of that one. And then Sunday, which, you know, I'm not sure if my birthday plans will fit into it, but Real Salt Lake plays <laughs> LAFC. Uh, Salt Lake has seemed to have the uh, the better of those matchups uh, of late and maybe historically. So, um, yeah, I might check that one out. Who knows? I think you should. I think that that is a, a fabulous way to celebrate uh, the birthday of Mr. <laughs> Kalen Carr. You look great, cupcake. buddy, by the way. Thank you. Haven't I'm... aged a bit in the in the four years that I have known you. Finally you, got a haircut. You look great, pan- kid. Post-pandemic. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, guys. Well, uh, make sure that you wish Kalen Carr a happy birthday and enjoy all of the MLS action this weekend. Have a good one, guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Happy birthday. (laughs) No, 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 no.